Thank you guys uh, for being here. Hopefully the All-Star Weekend here in Cleveland has been great for all of you. You guys have been able to come out and see some of these great uh, shows and meet some of these great different people that have been able to talk uh, and give different stories about diversity, helping people, and giving people equal rights. Um, Pam McGee is here uh, from the Women of Troy. Thank you for being here. Um, Pam, I, sometimes when I do things like this, I have to put my own setting. I'm 43 years old, and I've got sisters, I've got daughters, and my sisters were big fans of your guys' basketball team I can remember growing up. So for me, watching this was like going through my childhood and learning and knowing that my sister would set a pick on me and knock me out. <laughs> For you looking back at this, what is the first feeling that comes to you when seeing this? Uh, I, first of all, I got a microphone for you. There you go. It's already on. <laughs> oh, great. Um, I just enjoy the fact that they acknowledge that what we did was special. I mean, I was telling people that entire team, and one of the things that, that really motivated me is um, Brandon can know at USC they, they just bought this multi-million dollar facility for athletes. Right. You literally go in and put your hand on there and they have this big poster there and it says, if you want to be a USC scholar athlete, we want you to have the same tenacity of the women's basketball team of the 80s. Wow. <laughs> that was so powerful for me because, um, you know, obviously Cheryl Miller was the Michael Jordan of women's basketball, Cynthia Cooper, who is, you know, still and one of the greatest players ever. Um, and, you know, my sister and I, the standard that we set, and just the fact that we're family. You know, I think um, that whole team, Jamea Bond is like an assistant superintendent at Compton, Compton Community School Centers. Um, it's another girl on there that she's like the number one first African-American pilot. I mean, we had the highest GPA in USC history as far as a team collaboratively. Um, so I'm just excited that people got to see what we put together and that those relationships, they will last forever because they really are like, I call them my soul sisters. Wow. Sisters that come in your life and you have a soul relationship and God brings them and they become family and that's what that team it has been to my sister and I. Branson, was, you helped put this together. And Branson, I've known you for a very long time, and um, you're a guy's guy. You know, we like talking about Oakland Raiders football and things of that nature. Um, what made you want to be involved with this? And what did you, because I know for you to get involved for something like this, it obviously was something that meant something to you. But yeah. what did you learn as you got involved with this? Well, I learned a lot. And to give you some background, Andre, it was... Um, 2008, when um, I made a call to Cheryl Miller and I said, first of all, USC has one of the best film yes. industries in, in the country or, and as far as majoring in, in film, creating film, and, they, and they're one of the best. So first thing, I was shocked that no one had ever done a documentary. Uh, and, and so when I called Cheryl, I, I asked, I said, Cheryl, do you think this would be a good documentary? I want to, you know, talk to the team, things of that nature. So that was 2008. Okay. The film didn't get done to 2018. So it, it took that long to get it done. And thankfully, Gary Cohen, who's the executive producer, I, I came to him with the idea. And, and thankful for him, he believed in it, and we helped to get it produced. Um, but what did I learn? I mean, everything Pam had said, and I think what really irked me was people talked about the Fab Five. Like, right. Like they were the first <laughs> team of alpha males, and here we had alpha females to, to do what they did for college basketball. And I, I just thought that they deserved their recognition. And, you know, it, it was fun. You know, learned a lot, even more going through the process. Right. And I also want to piggyback on that. Well, my, my sister and I, we were the top two players in the country, one and two. So literally, we were like having two seven-footers in the men's game. And we really were recruited by, at that time, every major university in the country. And it boiled down to USC and I think Princeton, because we had good grades, wow. too. And coming from an African-American community with a, a teenage mother that had me at 17, I, she merely set a standard that, okay, I know you play basketball, but we're going to have a standard of excellence. She didn't allow anything less than a C to come in her house. And it had to be an A. And if it was below that, then we had issues. 
And she set a standard for us. So when we went to USC, USC wasn't even ranked. It wasn't even known for women's basketball. And I'm going to tell this story. They didn't they elaborate it in the film, but this is a, a, a true story. Cheryl Miller had committed to um, UCLA. She had verbaled to UCLA. She hadn't signed her letter of intent, but she had verbaled. The night before the day to sign, my sister and I spent the night over her house. The coach dropped us off, and we had played together in what we call the uh, Western, it's like the national team, regional sports festival, something like that. So we used to call her CM. So I go to her, and I say, CM, I'm going to be honest with you, and I'm going to keep it real. You're going to be player of the year. You're going to be a parade All-American. You're going you're gonna to win. You're going to you know, be like top player in the country. You're going to be ranked the number one player in the country. But we got one problem. She said, what? Well, you'll never win nothing. <laughs> That's how you, you recruited her. Because you got to come through us. And we're number two in the nation, baby. What you going to do? You'll never get to the show because we're number two in the nation. That is beautiful. And, you know, my sister had her on this side. I had her on this side. She was like, but y'all all Americans. You think it'll be enough balls for all of us to play? And I was like, I've been playing with her all my life. It'll be your night on Monday, my night on Tuesday, Paula's night on Wednesday. Let's get this done. She was like, y'all got to talk to my daddy. So we talked to Mr. Saul. We said, look, we really trying to do something special. We think with Cheryl on our team, we can build a dynasty, and she the missing link. And that's how history was written. Wow. Now you bring up Branson, the Fab Five. I look at where college basketball is now with Kentucky and, and, and with guys going to the league early. You guys were kind of the first that where you had all these top recruits willing to play together and be together. So – They've had legacy in more ways than just what we've seen. But I don't know if it's, you know, a gender issue or because we were female athletes. But that whole team, which I know for me as a businesswoman, my business acumen is different than most women. Because playing sports allows you that we really didn't have an ego. It was like, oh, you, you going for 30, I'm going for 20. You know, we didn't, like, whose night is it? It was like, let's just get it done. And we really set a standard, like, all we want to do is win. And, and, and we would literally get in the locker room like, yo, you got a weak one. Let's go. All the balls going to Cynthia today. And a lot of people didn't know Cynthia Cooper was the sixth man off the bench on that team. She really flourished in Europe and really created her own dynamic. She won in Europe. In Italy, she was the player of the year for like, and led in scoring, averaging like 45 in Italy for 10 years straight before, she, before the WNBA came into existence. When, Andre, I want to add some context to that. I mean, at, at this time, uh, women's basketball was the powers was in the South and the East. And for the first time, it was in the West. And not only in the West, it was black women who had swag, they were attractive, and they could ball. And, and I've said to Pam a few times, just think, you know, with athletes getting paid now, oh. if you guys, they were, you guys would be rich. They, they would need to be millionaires now. <laughs> For, for what they did. So, I mean, their impact not, not only was for basketball, I mean, women's basketball, but also for basketball, for what they brought out West and, and for black women uh, to get that type of stage at that time. When I bring up Title IX, does that, what does that mean to you in knowing, because I'm curious and I want to ask after this, like I brought up, I have sisters that looked up to you guys, and that gave, in my household, that gave my dad the ability to say, go get your grades, you can go play, you can be them. But who did you guys have to look at to say, I can be them? And I'm, I don't know if this is like some superstar syndrome or something, and my daughter asked me that, and I just thought, she thought it was so deep. She said, Ma, but how did you know how to go to college? How did you know how to get a scholarship? And I said, um, your grandmother. Wow. I said, um, your grandmother spoke that into my life. She says, look, I don't have any money to pay for college, but this basketball is going to get you guys to college. And she said, this is what, how we're going to do it. And she really spoke it. And at that time, they weren't really giving women. I was the, on the cusp of Title IX, so I was really the first female athletes that got a full-ride scholarship. Wow. They was doing you know, semi-scholarships or, or maybe books. But I was on that cusp of when we went from AIAW to NC2A and we got a full scholarship. And she says, but, but Ma, how did you know that you had to study to go to college? Nobody knew you the first person in your family to go to college. I said, you had a praying grandmother. Wow. And she had a vision for her children. 
and she, she spoke that into my life, and she set a standard. And I said, and I didn't know it, but she spoke it into my life. And now, you know, you see my son at the Phoenix Sun, she really set a legacy. But she was the one that spoke it into our life. And that's why I'm always teaching parents, you know, it's not where you came from. It's, um, you know, where you going. And we can't allow your past to determine your future. You know, they look at my press clippings, but nobody will say, like, you know, I'm a Hall of Famer, I'm an Olympic gold medalist, but nobody says that, that my dad was an alcoholic. No one says that my dad used to beat my mom. You don't read that. But for me, when I was 18, I always said, that's their history. I ain't got nothing to do with that. I'm creating my own journey. I create my own destiny. God bless you for saying that. But I got to ask you about Title IX. Because as guys, as males, I mean, that was our way out for so long. Hey, get a scholarship. Same thing that your grandmother said. Same thing was said to me. Same thing. Go get that scholarship because so, we don't got the money to pay for it. Did you understand Title IX or did you understand Title IX better after being around these ladies? I understood it. And, you know, one thing, and I talked to my, my wife. There, there she is, Lori. You know, when, when, she, when she grew up, she wanted to play baseball like her brother's. And the league wouldn't let her play because girls aren't supposed to play baseball, which is totally wrong. You know, and, and, and my mother, she had a, it wasn't scholarships, you know, back then in the 50s, but she had an opportunity to go to Alcorn State to play basketball. But because where she came from, uh, Utah, Alabama, and that's spelled with an E, yes. <laughs> <laughs> didn't have the monies to go there. And, and then there was fear in the South at the time, because Emmett Till was murdered at that time, so there was the fear there. So she didn't get the opportunities that a lot of women got to take with, with Title IX. So, you know, and this is the 55th year anniversary, is yes. that right, for Title IX? So, which yeah. which uh, I think is something that needs to be celebrated, because it not only gave women an opportunity to play sports, but gave them an opportunity, like the women of Troy, to get their degrees and post-degrees. So I, I, think it's a, I think it's a wonderful thing. Pam, why was doing the Women of Troy important to you? A, because um, I want my granddaughter to be able to look back. Now, I, I do have pictures of my granddaughter. She goes, JaVale's daughter, she goes to USC, and they sent me pictures of her pointing at the, oh. the banner. <laughs> you know, And then locker room, I'm, I'm posted all over the USC locker room. And ironically, when JaVale played here in Cleveland, the coach... Um, my daughter was friends with her son, and so now she's a head coach at USC. So I have pictures of my granddaughter walking through the USC arena and USC locker room and saying, oh, that's granny, that's granny, that's granny. So that's deep for me. And I also want women to believe. You know, I, I, I'm a firm believer in that you can put images in front of people, and you may not know them, but you just want to say, I don't know how she did it, but I want to be like her. And, and, and then you can set a standard and you can set goals for your children. I, I know playing basketball, I'm different in business than most women because I didn't grow up playing with dials. I grew up at the park playing with men saying, look, I got next. And they was like, you don't have next? Yes, I got next and it's my game. <laughs> and then I would hold the court down. So I had to get my game to a point where I could compete not only with women, with men and control the game. And, I, and so I know when in business, when I'm negotiating contracts or whatever, I never look at it like I'm a woman, I can't have it. I look at it like it's money on the table, I'm gonna go get it. I love it, I love it. As you watch the film, it, you guys had so much success and it was so fun and then to know that what was next. I'm curious, inside your guys' locker room as you've won championships and you've established and you've graduated, but there wasn't a WNBA. What was the feeling like and hearing you and your sister talk about going to the Olympics and like, what was just that whole feeling of, okay, what's next, even though we've accomplished so much already? Uh, I, I think, um, um, I know for me, and I think it's a, a personality trait. I met Dr. J, and after Dr. J retired, he told me, it's always another mountain. You know, the mamba mentality. I mean, I, anything I do, I'm going to do it at another level. I don't know if it's a personality. I don't know if it's because I'm a world-class athlete. I just think that I always knew that I was different. I always knew that I felt that uh, I say I'm a bridge layer. Like, I always knew, especially being an African-American female, that I had to set a different standard because I was always the first. And if you're the first, you know, 
you know, from anxiety to every level, you know that you have to s set a certain standard because of different culturals, cultural people's identity of black people. I remember this was in 1980, and this is a true story. My best friend, the first person I met on campus, she said, her name was Chrissy House, I have never seen a black person. I was like, Chrissy, this is 1980. She says, I'm telling you, I have never seen a black person, only on TV. She said, at my school, we're 99% white, and we got 2% other, and they're Asian. I was like, Chrissy, that's impossible. She says, no, it's true. So the more images we see of positive black women who are articulate, feminine, and uh, walking that, my mother put me in charm school. So she said, yeah, you're going to play like the dudes on court, but when you walk in the room, you're still going to be all woman. And I'm all woman. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I tell people, I love being a woman. If I died, I'd probably come back as a transvestite. Cause I'm <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, I've never transitioned out of someone saying that. <laughs> um, but I love it. I got to say, I love the film, and I want many people to see this film. I do, because the story is unbelievable. Um, I remember the Olympics. Cheryl Miller, for me, I, I, I got to tell and this is a me story, because I've been a sideline reporter for a very long time. I've done NBA, Major League Baseball, football. But 15 years ago, I got, to, I got on a plane to go to an All-Star game. And I happened because I think the Cavs had played here, TNT had, that did the game, and Cheryl Miller was on the same row as me on the flight. And... I was nervous like I was sitting next to Michael Jordan. Like, I, I, like, like for me, like I, was like, I was like, I gotta say the right thing. I don't wanna sound stupid. I don't wanna seem like a fan, but I am. And finally, like halfway through the flight, I finally kind of said, hey, you know, this is who I am. You know, I, I read growing up that you used to kick your brother's butt. And she, and she looked at me and she said, I did. And it was so cool to me because she was so down to earth. And I remember I got off the plane and like a little, little boy, I called my mom. I said, Ma, because she was like, well, who'd you, meet? and I was like, I sat next to Cheryl Miller on the plane. I guess what I'm saying is you guys transcended the woman male thing by that team where I, and I've said this to Branson, I didn't even look at you. It didn't even matter that you guys were women. You know, do you understand where I'm, where I'm saying like that was like, I was in awe. And just to show you, so iron sharpens iron. Cheryl Miller is the hardest working athlete, period. I mean, we would play games, and at that time, our team, our practices were more competitive than our games because we would blow teams out by 80 points. And we blowing teams out by 80 points. Cheryl Miller would still dive under the table to go get the ball. I'm like, Cheryl, we're up by 80. <laughs> she said, I know, I know. That's just the only way I know how to play. And it's like that in practices, and we we're all extremely competitive. But we were also like family. Like, she still had to navigate how to navigate being the Cheryl Miller and so me being her older sister or like, I help her navigate that space. And, and, and you can't really, um, and we're still, we're, all of us, we're really close and we're really tight. But that basketball unity in the locker room, I try to tell parents, let your daughters play sports. Because you cannot, I don't know how you can um, duplicate what you learn in the locker room and just having the relationships and, and all these women come together for one common goal. So I just enjoyed that immensely. Uh, Andre, let, let me add. Now, now, in my neighborhood, we were the opposite okay. of you. Okay. We saw them as women. I mean, when the Lakers played, we, you know, we go to the park. And it's like, dude, we got to take a break because USC women's on. Really? You know, I mean, we, we appreciated their beauty and their athleticism. I mean, we, you know, we just had to see it. I mean, my good friend Gerald, he, we grew up in the same era. It was like, USC women? And when I told my friends, I was doing the documentary, oh, you met Pam McGee? You met Paula? <laughs> you yeah. met Cheryl? You met Coop? What? Right. And that's the same reaction when I tell them when I meet you know, a Dr. J right. or Michael Jordan. It's the same reaction. And, and I don't think there's anything wrong to appreciate their beauty be, and the fact that they are great athletes. I mean, sure. I think that just, it, it's a total package. It is. And I think as, as a father, as a black male that's a father, as a, it's awesome that I can look at my daughter and I can say the same thing. And we say it to my niece. I see my, I, I got to tell you, I got a niece that's a pretty good basketball player locally. And my dad, old school from Alabama, not far from the Utah with the, 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 with the,
And he said something to me last Saturday, and I swear to you, we got in my car, we had my daughter with me, and he looked at me, he goes, man, I never thought going to women's basketball games, girls' basketball games would be more fun than going to, to watch boys play. He goes, I love how hard these girls play, how they play the game the right way. How, and, and I looked at him and we chuckled and he said, I get more excited when you text me to go to a girl's game than I do to go to a guy's game. <laughs> if that, and I think that comes from what you guys have established in how to play. You look at those UConn teams, the Tennessee teams. Um, you know, Parker was here when she won one of her championships. That was here in Cleveland, the Final Four was here. And I remember at that same time, all the, the, the girls from every neighborhood wanting to come see that Final Four and how they played. I will ask you, Pam, what have you seen change in college basketball and, and in basketball in general because of you guys? And what more do you want to happen or see to happen? Um, you know, um, because I've been on the journey a long time, I just want the game to get the recognition that it needs. You know, I, I haven't, we haven't figured out the model, but I just don't understand how Russia can pay so much money, right. how we can go to Japan and make a lot of money. We can go to China and make a lot of money. I know it's, it's uh, the, the, the prices, I mean, the, the contracts have gotten larger, but I'm still trying to figure out the business model that why we can make a million dollars in Russia right. and we can't capitalize on that here in the States. And so I'm still dealing with that, but I just want fathers to take their daughters to the games. I want everybody to support the W and then bring, you know, your team, your church or whatever. But we have to get more fan support for the game in itself. Branson, how do we do that? Because you and I, we've been in this beast that is the media of sports. And go ahead, brother. Go ahead. The mic's right there. This is a, hey, this is family with all those in here. Every, Go ahead. They record. You can go right in that microphone. Can you do that for me? And uh, one of the ways I can tell you to get it going, like you just asked them, is you got to get show this film. This film was a, it was a tearjerker too. I, you know what I mean. This film was was I awesome. Agree. This film was awesome, and. Uh, you know, I knew, just like Branson said, I knew Pam and the team, and I knew they were great, and I watched them, you know, Cheryl was awesome. But you know, I, at the, today, I did not know Cynthia Cooper was on that team. Now that I saw that segment of Cynthia Cooper, I have even more respect, and so will everybody else that sees this film. This film was an awesome contribute to women's basketball. I agree. You have to get this out more marketable or whatever because um, I'm, I'm a good critic. I say I'm a good critic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And also, I don't think people know, Cynthia and I played in the Ronchetti Cup and we were r ranked as the top point guard and big man and we won the Ronchetti Cup in Italy. Wow. She played with, we played together in Italy and won the Ronchetti Cup, which is I like the, guys, we were like the NBA NBA, the, we was the, like the WNBA of Italy. Right. Cynthia Cooper, we won the championship, the Ronchetti Cup, together. We played on the same team, and this was after college. And it was funny. This is a true story. We almost got in a fight. <laughs> <laughs> no, because I was stinking up the gym. And Cynthia and I have gone through, you know, we've been friends. You know, it's, it's like you, Cynthia Cooper, the superstar, but I knew you from Watts. <laughs> you know? So what are we doing here? And one day, I was just so upset with myself. We was, in the, we was playing terrible. And Cynthia swung at me. I was like, why would you swing at me? And I, you know, out of reaction, I swung back. And I said, Cynthia, you're my teammate, really? So I said, so they canceled the game because it was raining or something. So we, and we roommates, right? So she comes in. And I says, no, Cynthia, I'm not talking to you today. She says, why? I said, because I just, I just not want to talk to you, Cynthia. And I'm telling you, Cynthia, you, you got to give me some time because I'm not going to talk to you right now. And she says, all right. But um, I'm glad I ducked. <laughs> and so the team came in and they said, well, we said, well, we've resolved our issues and you guys just have to find both of us. So there's this hidden um, community of players saying like, look, what we do is what we do and the management don't need to know our stuff. You know, that was that old school locker room. What happens in the locker room stays in the locker room. And we looked at each other and we laughed. And she says, I'm just glad I ducked. 
<laughs> and, and then the team came in, so what happened? What happened? What did you guys do? And we said, we resolved our issues. You just have to find both of us. And so that just shows you how when you have a relationship with a person, even, become, even when you become pros, that relationship transcends how much money we make or whatever level we plan on. You know, to answer your question, Dre, about um, what can we do, yes. I think it's just a matter of the league funding more money. I mean, they're, they're doing it with the WNBA. They're trying to put some money in it. And I, I was talking to some WNBA players yesterday. The women don't have a G League. Right. Um, and we're not saying you should have the same numbers as the men the first year, right. but maybe if you have eight teams and put them in cities that, that don't have professional sports right. and, and just try to continue to grow it. And, you know, thanks to my buddy Gerald, he talks about the film to bring attention. How about more articles about the women? That's where I was going and, to, yes. And not just on the court. What are they doing off the court? Right. And, and let people get to know them. And it's just, just a matter of promotion. But, you know, anything in sports, if, if you put some money into it, yep. then I think people will gravitate toward it. Pam, what was it like going from playing at USC to playing overseas in the 80s? And just what, like, what was that like? And what was that compared for a girl that grew up the way you grew up? To have to go through. The so I so and also I, I want to make sure we know this. Um, I really don't know because you got to understand. I had a nine-month-old baby. Wow. I was a single mom with a nine-month-old baby, traveling to a foreign country where I didn't speak the language. Wow! But I was such a premier player. The teams would pay for my nanny. And they would pay that JaVale could go to each and every game. And he literally would sit in a stroller. This would be the team. My nanny would sit. Like, if this is the end of the bench, the nanny would sit at the end of the bench. And JaVale would sit on the other side in a stroller in every game. And every bus ride, he was at every bus ride. And he would just go from the front of the bus to the back of the bus. And he was like a little player. He knew all. <laughs> I'm, I'm talking about a, a player. Like, I, like one, he would sit in the front. The girl would say, JaVale, I thought you was my boyfriend. <laughs> and then he'll be in the back of the bus, and he'll go talk to her, and then he'll come back. he say, but baby, you know I still love you. And he was a player back then, but and he was. And, and all of my teammates loved him. And so um, when you ask me that, I don't really know, because now when I look back, I'm like, I don't even. People ask me. <laughs> well, if you, if you give me a second, I was going to ask you. She has a daughter that was drafted professionally as well, and JaVale. <laughs> we gotta bring him. We gotta bring him everywhere we go. <laughs> like we're talking about getting, so getting the message out. The wait, message, yeah. I'm gonna piggyback off of that okay. because it's true. So what is hilarious to me? No, hilarious. I just get. I just start cracking up. It is hilarious to me. So I go into places and people say. I know you, I know you. Wait, Hall of Famer, Olympic gold medalist, uh, two-time national champion, woman has won on every single level. Oh no, you big fella mama, you JaVale mama. <laughs> My claim to fame now is you JaVale mama. That's I'm like, great. Yes. JaVale mama. Not that I'm an Olympian, not right. I'm, you JaVale mama. <laughs> and I wear that badge like a badge of honor. Yes, I am JaVale mama. That is hilarious. Well, you and you had a daughter that was drafted as well to play professionally. Yes. And let's get that out there as you well. You know, I also have a daughter. Her name is Amani. Amani played with the Chicago Sky, the Atlanta Dream, and her last team was the Dallas Wings. And she took a leave during COVID, and she'll be finishing law school. Ooh. She'll be finishing law school this this June. As a mother, as a black mother, what does it mean to you that you've had the success off the... You joked about it, but you're JaVale's mom. You know, people look at you. You have a daughter that's getting ready to be... What does that mean to you that you were able to accomplish all those things, but also as a mother you were able to, to raise these kids the way that you have? These adults now. <laughs> and, and that's where who I am. I tell anybody, and um, I mean, and even when I used to negotiate my contracts... My obligation and my first job, my first ministry, is to my babies. I'm a mother first. There were some teams that I couldn't play. I told my agent, you can't call me. I can't, don't, don't call no teams in Israel. I can't take my baby to Israel. I can't take my baby to Russia back then. They still had the wall up. 
So I said, I don't even give me the money because my first responsibility is to this gift that God has given me. And um, so um, I just realized that, you know, they tell us we can have it all. No, my first responsibility and my first priority is to be a mother. And so God bless me that, that my children are extremely successful and I always let them know that even though I was the mother that birthed you, you had a grandmother that cleaned toilets for $1.25 an hour. And I have to tell my multi-million dollar children, don't ever forget. And I said, you know, and I keep, and one of the reasons why we have such a good relationship, because um, I'm, like my mother was to me, she always kept it real. And, and true story, I'm gonna give you guys a new story. So my sister and I were number one and two in the country. And I was at SC and they had me coming off the bench. And so I called my mother, I'm transferring, mama, I'm transferring. I'm going to Notre Dame. Don't they know I'm the number one player in the country? And I'm a freshman. And she says, this is old school mother. She says, okay, baby, okay. So, but we just got one problem. And I said, what's that, mom? Now I'm distraught because I want to transfer. And I'm calling my mama crying. I'm a 17 year old across the country, 3,000 miles away from Little Flint, Michigan. Mm. And I say, but mom, they won't play me. And I am, I'm, I'm, I'm transferring, I'm going to Notre Dame. And my mama said, well, we just got one problem. And I said, what's that, ma? Where you gonna stay? <laughs> oh. Where you gonna stay? I was like, what are you talking about, mom? Where you gonna stay? I sent you there to get an education. Suck it up. <laughs> You'll get over it. You'll get over it. I'm like, suck it up. I want to, no, mom, I'm trying. Suck it up. I work too hard. Wow. I work too hard. See, Suck Dre, it up. That was my old school mama. That was the kind of mama I had. See, Dre, that's an example of. Um, and four years later, national champ, two champ, back to back. See, she knew. Yeah. So sometimes you just got to endure the process. Yes. How's your sister? Good. She's in. She's a. Uh, she has a PhD in Hebrew Bible, and she lives in Memphis, Tennessee. Wow. Wow. And and, and as I was gonna say. You know, I get two criticism about the documentary. You know, one, it, it wasn't long enough. True. 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 And, and two, that it could be five documentaries on each yes. of the players. No, and I am telling you, Cynthia Cooper is one of my best friends. Cynthia Cooper is the strongest person I have ever met in my life. I mean, Cynthia has went through some traumatic things in her life. And she is the one person that I call or that will say, okay, what we gonna do? What we gotta do? No, we're not gonna cry about it. If it's milk on the floor, we're not gonna cry about it. We're gonna get a mop. What we gotta do? That's how strong she is. And this is a little girl that came from Watts, you know, um, with, you know, I came from poverty, but Cynthia came from another level of poverty. <laughs> You know, there's levels of poverty. Right. <laughs> oh, and so, and also, Rhonda Wyndham was the point yeah. guard that was in the documentary. She has a PhD as well in occupational therapy. Wow. wow. And Leanne, who's also on there, she has her own dental practice. She owns three dental offices: one in Hawaii, one in LA, and somewhere else. Wow. Who's looks like you got to do part two, man. And who's the pilot? Who? Which pilot? one's the airline's pilot? Oh, that's Melissa. Melissa was the first African American, I think, airline pilot, female airline pilot for United. And everybody can't get through USC. I'm just telling you. We were academically sound. Ju Juliet Robinson is the the highest, one of the highest paid defense attorneys, wow. who has a law degree, on the same team. What's your favorite athletic achievement out of all the achievements that you have? <laughs> giving life to JaVel McGee and Amani McGee Stafford. Wow. Those are my babies and part of my legacy. That's, that's beautiful. And, and what touched me the most is, and this is just the truth, this is insider, um, insider information. But I was, you know, and this is just my mama talk, but he won the championship with the Lakers and they thought they was gonna bury him in Cleveland. But y'all don't understand. But they didn't understand. I'm just here to tell you. They didn't understand that my baby got a praying grandmama and a praying mama. I said, baby, don't worry about it. Because touch not my anointing. God is in this. And my baby came an Olympic gold medalist. 
They thought they buried him, but he became a tree. Come on, somebody. It's Sunday. Don't let me get off yes, here preaching. Man. They thought they was going to bury him in yes. Cleveland. My baby became a tree and grew fruit. You know, I'm an Olympic gold medalist. Somebody, come on. Yes. That's what, you, that's what happens when you got a praying mother and a praying grandmother. And I, I know it's Sunday, but I ain't trying to preach, but it's just. You're good. No, you, you had all. <laughs> Can I tell you a secret? I was, uh, I was doing sideline for the Cavaliers this year. And J.B. Bickerstaff, who's the head coach, and he's been up here. Um, and you know how you had those conversations before games. And, and you know, in the, in the league, everyone, it's a family. Everybody kind of knows everyone. You know, everybody's played with someone or knows a, a teammate. And JaVale came up to JB and said, thank you. And, and, I, you know, and, he, and JB said, man, he goes, I was never going to let you down. You know, kind of, you know, he's like, I was, he goes, I pushed him because he goes, he's got more talent than every coach was giving him an opportunity to play with. You know, and it was one of those conversations where you were praying for him, his grandmother has prayed for him, but a guy like J.B. Bickerstaff looks at guys and he says, wait a minute, there's a reason why you're in the league. I'm going to keep pushing you to make you play up to your potential. And he told then later on in the media scrum, he said, he goes, if we run pick and roll, screen and rolls, he goes, JaVale's going to take that away. He goes, I've had to tell my team, like, we can't do that against him. And it's funny because the narrative on the outside, you don't hear that. But when I'm around NBA coaches, head coaches, I go, no, no, no. Don't mess with him. And, and I tell JaVale this, and I'm just saying this from a mother's perspective. Every team he's been on, and I tell him this, I said, as a mother, I'm just telling you, JaVale, I know you win championships, you make a lot of money, but janitors come to me, Miss McGee, Miss McGee, we love your son. Um, the, the COVID lady, we love JaVale. Oh, my God, he is just the nicest person. I'm say, and I say, JaVale, those people, the janitor, the usher, they don't have, they come out, they wait. They, yo, we love JaVale. He's just such a mannerable person. I said, JaVale, that's home training. I said, because they don't have to come to me and do that. I said, if I did anything as a mother, you being a citizen, and even when, when the Cleveland traded him, he said that the general manager called him and said, every player on the team called him and said, My, why didn't you trade JaVale? That's our dude, you know? That's true. Why would you trade him? That's our dude. We're all upset. You could have traded anybody else, but why would you trade JaVale? So, you know, he's even a good locker room guy. Truly. <laughs> what, are, what are you doing in your life now? What, what motivates you daily? What are you doing still to this day? Whatever the hell I want to do. Yes, <laughs> No, um, no, no, I mean, I am blessed. Thank you, Father, the most high. You know, I'm blessed. I have some beautiful children that really love and celebrate their mother. And I'm still trying to learn, you know, really trying to learn how to live in that. I was telling um, his wife, I said, it's just, you've been a single mother and we sacrifice so much. Really, JaVale has really taught me. He just surprised me with a 2021 20, 10 miles on it, X5, white, fully loaded, sitting on 22s, uh, yes. wait, I'm, BMW. And I said, Ma, look outside. I said, boy, what you buying me a car for? My car paid for, I don't need, who, this is my son, who does that? It's a gift, Ma. This is my son when your kids, it's a gift, Ma. Baby, I got it, my car's paid for, why would you buy me a, it's a gift, Ma. And I said, Oh, okay. It's a gift, Ma. And he, then he says to me, what? Why are you blocking my blessings? I'm blessing my mama. I know you sacrificed for me, and I want you to have a new car. So I'm just telling you. I, I had to like, okay. I'm telling you, because as single parents, you know, it wasn't easy. N no child support, putting them in private schools, traveling. I mean, not, not just traveling, I'm going to Europe. And, and not only did I was a professional basketball player, I had a job and a hustle and put them in top private schools by myself. So I'm just telling you, it was not easy. <laughs> <laughs> to the young ladies out there, what is the advice that you would give to them going forward in their lives, whether it's on a basketball court or in a classroom? Love yourself. Love yourself. Walk in your anointing. Understand that you are a gift from God. And it's called the Esther anointing. Love yourself, know who you are, and know your value. You're a gift. And if somebody don't know what to do with that gift, you let him go. I'm a gift. 
every good and perfect gift comes from God. And a man that findeth the wife findeth the good thing. And if he don't know what a good thing is, then pass, because there will be another Boaz that's coming behind him. I'm a gift. <laughs> Man, Brent, as, as he has his show going, I'm like, <laughs> and we're gonna let him go because I love him. But you know, um, I would ask for questions from the crowd, but you would have took over already. Brent, let me ask you this as, as a journalist. And I don't want to speak for you because I've looked up to you. I respect what you've done and I know what you've done and where you've been. How much more does it mean to you to do something and be involved in something like this that says a message that can help young ladies, that can help, it can help young men um, than just doing the, the stuff that sometimes we've just been told we have to do in our jobs. You know what I mean, where it's go cover this, go do this. But when you can get involved in something that you know that's, that's deeper than just a box score. You know, well, personally, it was... Uh it was a goal, Some, something I, I, I always wanted to do, and it took 10 years that, to, get, to get it done. So, you know, so I was happy about that. And it, it just drove me uh, because, of, because of the women. I, I believe that they needed to be acknowledged, just like any other uh, great team in, in the history of team sports. And, you know, and I have daughters. Um, my youngest daughter, Brandis, is here. And my, my niece Mika is here, and um, you know, and, and it's for them, for them too. And as I said earlier about my mom, you know, being a basketball player, you know, she'd watch those games when I'd rush home. She said, oh, "Are those girls on again? Can you turn those girls on?" And she was talking about the USC women. So, so I, I think it was uh, something that needed to be done, and I'm just glad that I, that I was part of it. I agree with G. We need we need more. We need more. We need more of that. I need I need an individual one on each one. Now I know we got to get some financial backing, so please. Oh, that's I'm looking to add that. I'm telling, I'm telling you, the Cynthia Cooper story, that I, in itself, they just tapped on a little bit of all the stuff she's gone through and, and endured. I'm sure. What I saw, I loved. I want more. I want to know more. And I think most families want to know more because that's the other thing that you guys accomplished in this. This is a documentary that you can sit down with your kids and your family and tell a story of. This is where we were at, this is where we're at, going, and when we want to continue to go, we want to have people like this leading us there. So thank you, Pam, so much for giving your story and letting us be a part of it. Thank you, Branson. If anybody has any other questions, I know you're going to take over, Gerald, and you're going to do your own show <laughs> when, we <die. laughs> when we are done. But uh, thank you so much. I appreciate it, and I hope everyone here appreciates it. Hey, Jerry, we have some giveaways. Oh, really? Yeah, we Let's do. Let's go. We got some giveaways. See, they surprised hey. me. Go ahead, Brandon. So it's right behind you. You got it? Yeah, I grab yeah, it for you. Got it. Yeah, we have some giveaways. And since, since you're the voice, we're going to have uh, you give stuff away. Okay. I'm, I'm team player. Whatever you need me to uh, do, see. I can do it. Let's start off with uh, let's start off with a book. Okay. Remember, remember the Rockers. Ooh, yeah. at the end of the day, this is a good one right here. Um, how are we giving it away? How you... Trivia, trivia, Maybe some trivia. Who uh, you have a question in your mind? Are you going to do it? Who won the slam dunk competition the last time the NBA All Star Game was in Cleveland? <laughs> Kiss. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, man. <laughs> you got it. It's Kobe. All right. It was Kobe. Yeah, you got it. You over here. Give me your phone. <laughs> that was good. Oh, that was real good. There you go. <laughs> that was quick, though. See? All right, Drake. We got, okay. shirts. got some shirts here. Shirts. See, they tell me I was going to do. Um, but I'll figure something out. Let me think of, uh, do you know this answer? Who won the three-point competition that year? Go ahead. That's Siri. You know? It may have been Glenn Rice. I, I, look, they know. They were here 25 years ago. Glenn Rice sounds about right. Was it, we got to look it up. We got to look it up. <laughs> you can't ask a question. Hey, no, know. right? I shouldn't be. Hey, Pam, he put me up here. He tell me I was doing this. <laughs> <laughs> you got to at least ask Trinity. Yeah. yeah. I, I went to church. I didn't know I was going <laughs> to. It's been a long weekend, and now you got me out <laughs> Dealing with weather and everything else. We gonna, you know what? We're giving it to you. Yeah, just give it to I'm him. I'm giving it to him. He, you said Glenn Rice? You get Glenn Rice. Okay. What else you got? This one. I got one. Um, what was uh, Pam's number? 
Ooh. Mm -mm. <laughs> Keep, going. Keep going. Three. Yeah. Keep going. Four. Five. Who said thirty? Who said thirty? You say thirty over there. The quiet. You quietly said thirty. Girl, you can take it. Don't be. Come on. You, you catch it. If you said thirty, you gonna get it. <laughs> Ooh. Ooh. Okay. All right, what's Branson got going here? He put a flash on there on the phone. Okay, all right, all right. All right. You got me doing way more than I planned on doing, <laughs> man. I'm telling you, I ain't <laughs> I love you. Here, let me see. I don't even know if it's coming up on mine. Oh, that's sweet. Okay, you got it upside down, but it is sweet. All right, yeah, 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 I did. Okay, let me see. They got it up there, too. See, they got it. Okay, so we got to have a good question. That's sweet, man. Yeah, it shows up in a different... I don't, where'd you get that at? Okay. Who was the first MVP of the WNBA? Hmm. Oh, look at you. You was paying attention. Good job. Is that it? Is that everything? Thank you guys so much. I hope you guys are enjoying Cleveland and enjoying moments like this. I appreciate this. Thank you. Seriously, thank you so much. We appreciate you guys. Enjoy the rest of your Sunday and take some of Pam McGee's stuff. With, take, to take this with you and learn and, and make the most of it. You need a bodyguard? <laughs>